In Alpine, Texas, a civil forfeiture case is about to start up via Zoom for the 394th Judicial District Court. Seasoned attorney Rod Ponton is representing the state of Texas. When I heard that everything was going to be on Zoom, I realized that an old duffer like me needed to get tip and get up to new technology. I'd learn how to get on Zoom and interact with the judge and other parties in their cases. He's a lot like me, that if I have my druthers, I'd have a millennial sitting next to me at all times, senior problems. Today, Rod's personal computer is tied up, so he's using his assistant's computer. He logs into his Zoom account and waits in the waiting room until Judge Roy Ferguson is ready to let him into the hearing. In the Zoom waiting room, my face was there. Uh, everything looked normal. But when they all appear in front of the judge, one of the appearing parties looks a little different because this particular attorney, Mr. Ponton, popped into the hearing as a sad-eyed cat. Can you hear me, Judge? It, it, was, it was a pathetic-looking cat. If that was my hearing as a judge, I may have been a little impatient, like, who's playing games with me? When did a cat become a lawyer? But in this particular case, the judge was cool, calm, and collective about the entire situation. Mr. Ponton, I believe you have a filter turned on in the video settings. Uh, you might want to... Uh... I don't know how to remove it. I've got my assistant here. She's trying to, but... Uh prepared to go forward with it that's i'm here live that's not i'm not a cat i can i can see that he's talking to the judge and he's a professional he stays in uh character <laughs> after about a minute of frantically trying to remove the filter ponton is finally able to drop his cat-like persona it seemed like it took hours or days to get rid of the filter it was the, the longest seconds of my life. At first, Ponton thinks his secretary's tech-savvy child played with the computer. But in fact, he is a victim of ancient technology. It was a 10 or 12-year-old Dell computer that apparently had this filter on it when it was shipped. But it was so old, nobody could find it on their computer. Everybody who was involved in this little cat fiasco uh, was a really good sport, even the judge. And who couldn't love that face? It's 2019 in the Sherbinsky District Courthouse in Moscow. Leonid Grazer is facing murder charges for killing his 21-year-old sister, Ariada Coral. Now he's in court, and he's in a glass box. The glass box is used in Russian courts to hold some of the defendants who are on trial. Now, there's some controversy surrounding that, because think about it. Even in Russia, there is a presumption of innocence. However, that glass box already gives an impression that you are dangerous and that somehow you need to be contained. As Grazer awaits the judge, he is about to prove why he needs to be contained. Grazer is looking around from his glass uh, imprisonment like he's, he's gonna find a way out. The talking is not what this guy really wants at this time. He wants out, so he goes up. At this point, the officers realize, okay, we have a situation on our hands. You see this chaos break out in the courtroom as the officers are scrambling around trying to find the most effective way to gain control of them. They start hitting him with batons. Ceiling tiles are flying everywhere. And he's kicking. They're pulling his pants off, but they don't let go of his foot. One of the female officers goes around and presses a panic alarm. And what that does is it tells the rest of the command that you have a situation in a certain room. And so one of the other officers who's now on scene gets a taser. There aren't too many people who can just withstand or shake off the pain that a taser can inflict on someone. In fact, at some point, he's asking for help. Hey, give me your hand, give me your hand. Eventually, he's contained back in this box. Okay. 
So at the end, the police look, and all of a sudden, they realize they are on camera. Now, they're probably thinking, uh-oh, we're in trouble now. But in reality, they did what they were supposed to do. Grazer eventually faces a judge. And in September of 2020, he's sentenced to compulsory psychiatric medical treatment. It's unknown whether any changes will be made to security in the Shabinsky courthouse. I think these Russian bailiffs uh, are probably not used to this kind of escape attempt because that's the theory behind the glass box. It keeps the defendant in place. In the U.S., we are more used to defendants who try to exercise their freedom before they should. At the Highland County Courthouse in Hillsborough, Ohio, 33-year-old Nicholas Garrison awaits sentencing for fifth-degree aggravated possession of methamphetamine. He is a relatively minor meth possession charge, and he gets six months. But unfortunately for Garrison, there's more to come. Garrison is sentenced to an additional 530 days in jail because he committed these offenses while he was out on probation for burglary. The judge handed down the sentence. Mr. Garrison got up and then walked towards the door of the transport deputy. So Garrison is being prepped to be transported from the court back to county jail. They were just about to get the cuffs ready to put on him. And then that's when I felt him scrape up against my shoulder. He breaks free, bolts, and then the chase is on. My main part was to do whatever I can to get him. You're acting more than really what you're thinking. Officer Ben Reno is chasing the defendant, and he gets a hand on him as they get to the stairwell. And he goes over the railing head first and just literally slides down the stairs on his back. That really had to hurt. Just a split second decision. I knew at that time I had that much of a chance to get him. Unfortunately, he was hurt severely, but he just wanted to get the defendant. I got back up and ran out the back of the building. And I made it all the way down about a block. By that time, the adrenaline was starting to wear off a little bit. At that point, it's when I knew that uh, something was wrong, for sure. Soon after, Reno was whisked away in an ambulance. When I went to the hospital, that's where it was discovered, where I had four broken ribs, two broken vertebrae, and a concussion. Ultimately, what happens is the suspect gets away, and then video is released and made available to the public. In this surveillance video of Deputy Ben Reno taking this horrific fall as he's pursuing a suspect who fled, it had a huge impact on the public. And there were a lot of calls that came in to give possible locations or some type of tip on where Garrison was. Four days after his escape, police find Garrison at a motel 25 miles away. They immediately arrest Garrison, haul him back to jail, where now he is indicted on new charges for the escape. In a Pike County, Mississippi courtroom, 27-year-old Sidney Newsom attends an arraignment hearing for a domestic violence charge before Judge Aubrey Rimes. He's already serving a 50-day sentence for contempt of court. Anytime the court orders you to do something, you don't do it, that's contempt of court. And that's an indication that you're dealing with someone who does not respect the judge or the judicial process. In the midst of this uh, arraignment hearing, the defendant starts arguing with the judge. There's only one bailiff in the courtroom right now, and it's Brianna Perryman. And she attempts to lead the defendant back to the defendant's table, away from the judge. What I'm surprised is that there's only one officer in this courtroom at the time, knowing there are three other defendants in the courtroom. They could easily overtake one person. Finally, Newsom breaks away from her, and he's now throwing papers at the judge. He is trying to physically get to this judge. To do what? Nobody knows, but I guarantee you, it ain't good. Newsom's mother becomes visibly upset about the whole thing as it starts to unfold, and Newsom's brother, Willie Thomas, wraps his arms around her waist and starts to pull her back toward him. Chaos begins to spread throughout the court. Newsom throws a phone. He knocks over a computer. Judge Rimes leaves the bench, goes after the defendant to, to, to help his bailiff, and pins the defendant to the table. It's not often you see a judge get up from behind a bench to take somebody into custody. 
all of a sudden, while this craziness is playing out, Willie Thomas, the brother, joins the judge in helping to control the defendant, his brother. He appears to be trying to calm him down. But when three additional bailiffs storm onto the scene, they have no idea who started the brawl and view Willie as a possible agitator. And as they gain control of Newsom, they approach Willie Thomas and they take him down. Judge Rhymes sentences the defendant's brother, Willie Thomas, to 32 days for contempt of court for his interference that day. But his sentence is suspended after five days. It's absolutely shocking to me that Willie Thomas was charged with contempt of court. If you look at the video, it's clear that the brother is actually trying to help subdue the defendant. He's not trying to help him escape. In truth, he shouldn't have spent a single day in jail at all. Deputy Brianna Perryman files simple assault charges against Sidney Newsom, but they're dropped. I am absolutely surprised by the prosecutor's decision because Newsom was clearly out of control. Newsom is found guilty of domestic assault in connection with his original crime. He receives a suspended six-month jail sentence, six months probation, and is ordered to receive drug and alcohol counseling and to stay away from his victim. His actions have already prompted discussions about increased security at the Pike County Courthouse. I say always err on the side of have more than what you need. You can always send deputies away if you don't need them, but I think it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. At the 57th Judicial Circuit Court in Monticello, Kentucky, Judge Jennifer Upchurch Edwards is presiding over a domestic violence case. The complainant is John Anderson, and the defendant is Melissa Hardwick. The couple had been married 22 years, got divorced three years before this hearing, and they have three kids together. The divorce was very contentious. They're still having problems, and John has filed an emergency protective order against Melissa. In John's petition, he gave a long list of situations in which Melissa acted in a violent manner. He said that at one point she grabbed a tow hitch and she broke some glass to get entry into the house. He said that she said if she's ever gonna kill anybody, it would be him. So he really feels at this point that she's a danger to himself as well as to their children. Are you asking the court to enter an order restraining the respondent from any contact with you? Yes, Things have been escalating, I guess, since the first of the year. So Mr. Anderson starts to tell the court about the conflict between he and Ms. Hardwick. Melissa's had a couple uh, arrests, and she got out of jail in, I guess, April. She started- Our personal life is no, no. your business. But before he could even get one to two sentences into his testimony, Melissa Hardwick has already begun to interrupt. Nothing to do with Ms. Hardwick. No. You will be held in contempt of this court if you I become disruptive. I don't care. But Ms. Hardwick does not back down, and she doesn't shut up. I haven't done anything to this court. I haven't done anything to okay. him. She will be arrested I mean, for contempt any, of the court. Make any difference. You will serve uh, ten days for contempt of court. Ms. Hardwick has other ideas. Go now. And like that, she is on the judge's bench. This is a judge's worst nightmare. The judge is just inches from this crazy woman who is uh, apparently set on doing her harm. But before you know it, and before she can reach the judge, Deputy Adam Dodson steps in. Get off of me! Hands behind your back. Hands behind your back. We hear her yelling and flapping around on the ground, demanding that they let her go. And the judge is just kind of sitting there looking at her, um, you know, like, told you. Wait and see. You. You'll be saying what happens, Jennifer. So Ms. Hardwick decides to make her matters worse by threatening a judge, not even realizing that that could be a total separate charge in and of itself that could result in jail time. Once they got Melissa out of the courtroom, uh, you could see the judge kind of fumbling with her papers there for several seconds. And uh, as I watched her body language, it was clear to me that she was shaken by the whole thing, but she was able to maintain her professionalism. A new judge will have to be appointed to represent because she 
will be charged criminally for the threats that were made in open court today. She does let everyone know that she'll ultimately have to recuse herself from the case so that there can be no allegations of her having a bias against Ms. Hardwick. Melissa Hardwick receives 120 days in jail for contempt of court. If I was Ms. Hardwick, I would thank the bailiffs who grabbed her. Because had she touched the judge, she would have been looking at major years in jail. Melissa Hardwick is also charged with terroristic threats, intimidating a judge, and resisting arrest. But instead of more jail time, she receives five years of probation and mandatory mental health evaluation and anger management courses. As for Mr. Anderson, he gets what he came for. The emergency protective order will remain in place of no contact. It makes it very hard to defend against a domestic violence accusation when you apparently are a hair trigger violent person. And I'm sure her husband, John Anderson, was about to get to that before his ex-wife attacked the judge. It's June 2nd, 2014 in the Brevard County Courthouse. And Judge John Murphy has a busy day ahead of him. It is someone out there expecting me to call your name, and I have not done so. The judge is off camera, but you can see the courtroom is packed. Also in the courtroom today is public defender Andrew Weinstock, and he's representing a few of the defendants who are about to face the judge for the first time. The man at the podium is one of his clients. You have the public defender, public defender, what do you want to do? Have they caught him? They have. I'm not waiting. All right, what do you want to do? When you talk about waiving, you're specifically talking about the right to a speedy trial. The attorney said, we're not waiving, which means let's go. His right to a speedy trial, the clock is ticking. I want it on the calendar now. I'm not waiving. You want to set up for trial, set up for trial. He's being a little short and maybe even a little disrespectful to the judge. This is an you know, if I had a rock, state. I would throw it at you right now. You know, this is Stop a... pissing me off. So what's important to know about these two, the judge and the attorney, is that they have history. Weinstock actually describes that history as adversarial. Just sit down. I'll take care of it. No. I don't need your help. No, sit down. I'm the public defender. I have a right to be here, and I have a right to stand I said, and represent sit down. my clients. You cannot speak to a judge in a short or disrespectful way, especially in a room full of defendants and even other attorneys. Quite frankly, I was pretty surprised that the judge didn't warn him that he would hold him in contempt at that point. The tempers are high and it, it escalates very quickly. If you want to fight, let's go out back and I'll just beat your ass. I, I could not believe that the judge would say, you want to take this outside? And then the public defender says, yeah, challenge accepted. And they head into the hallway. It's unbelievable. While there are no witnesses to the initial conflict, the mic picks up some of the altercation. It kind of reminds me of a Batman episode where you see thud, pow, wow, flash across the screen. I don't know who's getting the best of who. Ultimately, the deputies are able to tear these two men apart, and attorney Weinstock leaves the courthouse altogether. So the judge walks back in. Thank you. And applause began to erupt. Got some water? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Of course, the clip goes viral and Judge Murphy uh, takes on a new nickname, the Fighting Judge. When the Florida Supreme Court got wind of this situation, they were not happy. Both men are ordered to testify about the incident. Weinstock says that when they were in the hallway, Judge Murphy punched him right in the face. But Judge Murphy says it was actually Weinstock who punched him in the chest and he never retaliated. Regardless of who started the fight, Judge Murphy takes the final hit. They decide that the judge lacked total self-control. In fact, they said that he was an embarrassment to the Florida judicial system, and they ultimately removed him from the bench. The only reprimand Andrew Weinstock receives comes from his own boss. 
A month later, Weinstock actually resigns as a public defender, and he does it because his boss was supporting the judge and wanted him to remain on the bench. I think they both should have been reprimanded in one way or the other, but I think the judge is looked at with a different level of scrutiny because, oh yeah, he's the judge. This is just a total embarrassment to the whole judicial system. I was embarrassed for them. If you want to fight, let's go out back and I'll just beat your ass. 